So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, is there anybody here who doesn't understand English? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to talk a bit of Chinglish, but mostly English, not Czech. Um, so, good afternoon. I hope you had a nice lunch and you're all fortified to do some listening to, to our presentations this afternoon. Um, so, my name is, is Bob Mann, and I'm from the UK. Um, and you can tell by my hair that, and the wrinkles on my face that I'm more than 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, but I still haven't forgotten all my work and my training. Um, for 40 plus years, I've been involved in the police and the security and the intelligence world, both for retail organizations, finance institutions, and government departments. So I have quite a wide range of uh, experiences uh, in my life. Um, I tried to write something on the board here, and I'm not too sure if you can see it. I will read it out to you. It says, trust no one, suspect everyone. And that's where I always start from. But I now have to change this because it's not very politically correct. Oh, I'm going nearer. So, all right, so it should be... Trust. These are very small pens, by the way, look at them. <laughs> but. This is some of the security tools I work with have these same features. So it's saying trust but verify. And I, that's the way I've always been in my life because Whenever you build something, or you organize something, or you have some policies, people will always go around them. Because security is seen as often getting in the way to a proper way of doing IT. So, how many people here run an IT network? One, two, okay, there's a couple. There's often a fight between IT and security. IT want to make you the biggest, fastest network in the world. And security say that's fine, but we have to put some brakes on because we have to stop hackers getting in. And there's always been a fight. I think there will always be a fight between IT professionals and security professionals. But it's not up to the security guys to determine risk. That is up to the company or the organization or the department how much risk they want to take. So if, if IT go with their story about what they want to do, and the security guy goes to the, the board and says, this is what we want to do, it's up to them to make a decision. And I'm comfortable with that. As long as they know that there are threats out there that will harm the network, and we have some sort of resilient plan to put in place, then I'm pretty comfortable with that. So, how many people here have met a Chief Information Security Officer? So we'll call it CISO for short, it's easier that way, rather than a long name. So how many of you have seen a CISO before? Okay, they come in various sizes. Most are taller than me because I've got short legs and they've got tall legs. Um, most of them um, are now young, and I'm, the polite word in English is mature. Um, is that me in the microphone, is it, doing that? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so, my job in a whole is to keep the organization I'm working for as secure as possible based on a risk profile um, and a risk appetite, it's probably the correct phrase, that the board of directors want. Now, I've been in this game, as I mentioned, several decades. I can honestly say I've never been to an organization and worked there where they have a one-line statement saying, what is our risk appetite? Because it's such a hard question to answer. And so I have to make it up as I go along and sometimes coerce. So, a CISO, um, I've got to avoid that microphone. The CISO has to have a lot of skills. Project management. Um, maybe a little bit of security knowledge would help. Um, he's got to be a negotiator. He's got to be a trader. He's got to be someone who's strong in front of a board. Because the board sits up here at sea level. And 
Not often are there security professionals like myself at that level. They keep you out because they know you bring problems to them and they don't want it. So you have to be a whole range of things in your characteristics. So excuse me for wandering around, but it's just something I'd rather do than stand behind there. And if I speak too quickly, because I get sometimes excited even at my age with security, then um, just tell me to slow down a little bit. And if you have any questions, can you please stop me at that point? Because I don't want you going through the rest of the presentation thinking in your mind, oh, I've got this question, I've got this question. Just raise your hand and say, hey, hang on a second, Bob, can you answer this question? I may not have the answer, but I would know a man who does somewhere. Okay, let me see if I've got this thing working properly. Okay, so the agenda is we're going to talk about leadership, which is much of what a CISO will do. We're talking about a discovery, we're talking about an assessment, a plan, a deployment if necessary, and then we'll talk about a summary and recommendation. So these are the key areas I'm going to explore, and I've hopefully got a couple of examples that will show you what the difficulty can be being a CISO. You don't win many friends, I'm afraid, being a CISO, but if you're of a disposition, you don't care, as long as you like your job, then it doesn't really matter. But you don't try and upset people, like it may be the IT fellows occasionally, but apart from that, no, you try and keep people on side because it's difficult. You want people to be on side because security is a team game. Okay? You can't do security on your own. It's just impossible. If your staff aren't with you, it's impossible, and they will let you down on a regular basis. Okay, so um, we have to understand the threats, first of all, and I find it's difficult in an organization when you ask people what are the threats, they just say, well, in the newspaper it was this threat, ransomware or malware, um, viruses, etc. And that's about all they know. But we have to make sure that we understand the threats because a threat can be there, but actually the impact to my company might be zero. So if it's a virus that's to do with Macintoshes, which they do have them, and my company has no Macintoshes, I don't care. I'll concentrate on the Windows environments. And so, but if you had, say, a Windows environment and it's Windows malware, then, for example, one of the things I would be worried about was what would it do to my network? What would it do to my servers? That's called an impact. The consequences of that are the next step. And that is to say, for example, if I'm feeding my customers information through, say, a web server, and the web server goes down, the problem for the IT guys is they've got to fix that system and bring it back online pretty quickly. The consequences are you may lose customers or customers can't get access to data, they can't get access to move money around or something. So we think of it that way, there's a threat, then there's usually a frequency that happens. Is it once a year, twice a year, or once every five years determines roughly how much money we will be available to spend. And then there's the impact. As I mentioned, say the server goes down for three, four, five hours. Um, and then there's the consequence of what would happen to the company from a business perspective. So we have to understand the threats. And when you talk to executive board members, they see the headline banners, but they, they assume, in certain in my personal experience, some um, answers that aren't credible to run the IT section or the security section. So as far as I'm concerned, the Security function is just no different from another function. Whether it's, um, I had my mouth open when you took that picture. That's the picture's going to come out. <laughs> um, so the, the, the problem here is that people don't realize that actually security is just another business function. Accounts is a business function, finance is a business function, IT is a business function. They all provide services within the organization. So, Security is nothing special. It is just another business union, unit that, that goes on and keeps the systems running. So there's only four main areas in this particular slide, and this slide is 40 years old, at least 40 years old. It's still applicable today. And you can see why IT get cheesed off with security, because we got our fingers in all these different pies, whether it's physical, electronic, data, it's all there in trying to secure the organization and keep it running. So they, they sh we should really have a really good working relationships with our IT function, and then we normally do. And then we just have to sit down from time to time when they want to put a new widget inside the network that we would, we would vet it first to see if it works. 
So I noticed, and I, I was paying attention to some of the slides earlier, although they were in Czech, they, luckily enough, they had pictures, so I could see that. But I understand that one of those devices was a cheap widget from China. And you'll find Chinese make most of our chipboards and stuff. But being from a government background, um, I don't trust them. And I, we, have, we have teams, and I'm sure that Czechs do, departments in the government that will um, really deep dive into those IT systems. They try and break them and crack them and find out, is there something hiding in there? Is there a back door to get to my network? And these things, honestly, they exist. So you can buy kit, and then even though you've configured it correctly and you've installed it on your network, it can make a tunnel underneath your data and just export it to someone else. And I think I was here three or four years ago. Um, I, I had a slide to do with, uh, with China. They have warehouses, almost like universities, of youngsters do nothing but hack. That's all they do. And there's tens of thousands of these guys. And there's a specific unit that is responsible for that. So if you go back to a couple of years ago, you can get the slides and you'll see exactly where that is. So you can see why I, I get a bit suspicious about people who give me stuff. I, and I've been, at the, I've been at the sharp end and that hurts sometimes. So this is the, what a business unit looks like uh, from a security perspective. And it grows uh, with technology. Okay, so this is just an example of um, putting that together. So we have comms interception. I think one of, them, one of the lessons this morning was about communications so that, and VPNs. So we've got we have a UK threat list, and I'm sure the Czech government has a threat list of people they're worried about. For the UK, it's mostly China and it's mostly Russia. And if you want to go back to my early career, I've always been very suspicious of the Chinese because they steal our IP. And they've been doing it openly for decades. And it's only now when I think it was President Trump and others decided enough was enough. But I think we, leak, we let them leak stuff for far too long. So anyway, we've got hackers that are external. We've got staff internally that if you had a, a perfect IT system is one that works and it has no users. So from a security perspective, an IT running nicely, but no users, because users will let you down. They'll stuff USB keys in. They'll add things to the network. They'll like, even add servers to the network. Um, a typical example is sales and marketing. Anybody here in sales and marketing before I say anything else and get into big trouble? Were there any lawyers in the room before I get into big trouble? Sales and marketing want to sell something now. They don't want to wait for it. They can't wait for IT to go and buy some new servers and some new desktops or whatever it might be and new comms. They will go to the internet and they will buy it. They will bypass IT and they will bypass security. And the only reason we know it's there is when it falls over and they come to you and say, our server's falling over. And IT will get together with, with the security guys and say, well, what server? And unbeknownst to us, they've got the web, okay? And they've bought the whole lot. They've bought an infrastructure on the web. They've bought the web servers on the web. They've got everything, and we know nothing about it. And they're giving away company data because they don't want to follow the rules. So it's a hard job for IT because they need to keep people and give them services, but users will always go around you, always. And so you have to bear that in mind. So that's why I like to verify now. OK, so I think one of the um, traits of a CISO is he has to be almost like um, a Knights Templar. They, were, they started in the 11, 13, something like that, and went on for 200 years, just about. Um, and they were a religious sect, but they were often barons and dukes, and they gave up all their land. So they promised that there would be chastity, there would be obedience, and there would be poverty. So they would give all their stuff away, and they would never go with a woman. It's just where they were. So unfortunately, I can't be a true Knights Templar because I'm, I am married, and I'm still married, and I'm hoping tomorrow I'll still be married when I get home. Um, <laughs> So I could never be a knight, but I have the heart of a knight that says, it's my job to protect the network and the infrastructure of the business. That is my job. 
and it's often a long one you, because hackers don't go to sleep. They're 24 by 7. So from a security team perspective, you just have to go and do that. And people ring up in the middle of the night. IT often ring you up and say, Bob, I think we've got a problem here. We've got some hacking going on. We're not sure. Or we've got some malware or ransomware going on. And then it's my job to go in and try and help resolve that issue. So can I ask a question then? How many people in here, from the business perspective, have suffered from a serious malware incident or a ransomware incident? We won't record who it is because the camera's pointing that way. How many? And there's six or seven. I think there's probably some people in the room. I'm reluctant to put their hands up. But the problem is that when they get in, they can really do some serious damage. And I've been in companies where we've cut ourselves off from the internet for two weeks. And globally, it was a global company, and it could be the USA, the whole of Europe, we're different countries, the, the UK, Canada. We just all cut ourselves off from each other, and we just had to take the pain, and we had to fix all those servers. In fact, every server we had was infected. And so we had no choice. We brought them all down and rebuilt them all, um, city by city, region by region. It took us uh, like a whole month to get back to where we should be. So for just a small amount of not paying attention, then the hackers will get in and that's it. They've got you. So when I arrive, so let's say that I'm the, CIS, the new CISO and I have a job description because that's what I looked at when I provided my CV to the, the company. But when you get there, there's often a mismatch between what they've got list of things you're responsible for and actually what you do. So if you look at this, I'm trying to detect friend from foe, and I, I, I was just joking about IT, but we have had problems in the past, so I would normally go and see IT as one of my first partners in crime, if you like. Um, and there are some preconceived expectations. I mentioned about the exec boards. They're expecting certain things from me, but those are based on an article they read while they were flying on a plane, like CEOs today or something, and then it, it's, it, they have the wrong explanation. Then do I have the necessary information? Often not. Um, do I have the necessary tools? Often not. Uh, I think IT are probably just ahead of security when you want money to buy things. Uh, because an IT will buy different bits of kit, servers and networks and routers and firewalls, which you can see and you can knock and you can touch. But from a security perspective, we're more behind the scenes and you can't really see what you're getting for your money. And then, I have to start thinking about crafting an initial plan. So I've been into interviews as a CISO um, for some major organizations, and they say, Bob, what would you do in the first 100 days? I know this is going out live, so I'll be in big trouble. I don't care, really. I think it's just a lazy question by someone who's trying to recruit me. It's a lazy question. OK, what would you do in 100 days? I have no idea what it looks like. I have no idea how big the network is. I have no idea how big my team is. I've no idea how cheesed off the IT people are. So it's an impossible question to answer at that point. So what I, what I have to do as a CISO is come up with a mini plan just for my first 100 days. So um, this is a good one. I, it came out in the one of the newspapers, the Times. And so um, what I was trying to say is that our, the, next, the next iteration of the Royal Air Force's um, fighter jets. It's going to be a combination of fighter jets and drones. So there's a fighter jet going to go up. Either it's got a pilot or it has no pilot. Then trailing behind it and to the sides of it and above it and below it will be drones and they will be unmanned. And that's got to go into battle. So what a great thing for the Chinese or for the Russians to get hold of that information because they want to control all the communications and if they go and control the communications we can't control the planes or the aircraft. So this is the typical of what I started working on 30 years ago because I was in the Royal Air Force for a number of years um, around the world and protecting where jets have information and this is a typical example of what's coming up in the future the, for the next uh, generation of, of jets for the Royal Air Force. Um, and I'm sure other countries will have something very similar. Okay, so what about discovery? I said to you I don't know anything about the network, but I have to. And understand it and analyze it within 100 days. It's, 100 days is, well, how many weekends in 100 days? So let's take two days from each weekend and that, chop that off the 100 days. 
How many public holidays are there in 100 days? There could be one or two. Take those days off. So your 100 days is quickly shrinking. And when you want to talk to people, like IT guys or finance uh, or the exec board, and they don't have time for you, or they keep delaying things, your 100 days is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So you've got to be quite selective of what you want to do. Is everybody with me so far? No problems? Okay, so I need to know what the structure looks like, and that's the organization structure, not just the security team. If, if I have a security team, often CSERVs are the very first person from a security perspective in an organization. Never had one before, and you have to start from scratch. And then I have to understand who my business and IT partners are, what data they've got, what corporate data is like gold mine, gold gems they've got, where's that stored? And actually, a lot of information is sensitive, is stored with all the other information. It's something like security by obscurity. You can't find the, really, the gold bits of the data, but you need to find out where they are. And then I need to find out the logical links and the physical links. So most companies uh, will have a link to someone outside their organization that might be doing remote management. So Foresight do a lot of remote firewall management for people. And we do a lot of uh, scanning and penetration testers will go and check systems. So there's always going to be connections to someone else and they may be providing a service to you. So we need to know about those. Um, then there's a budget. That's always going to be a pain. I, I Really quickly, I went to an organization. I'd been in a, a CISO role. And I had three, four people in my team. Within three weeks, I went in front of the exec board and said, I need a quarter of a million pounds. If you multiply that by 30, that's how many crowns, roughly, that I wanted. Just as like seed money. This is what I could see within, within three weeks. Kind of have that. And I explained to the board in simple terms, if you don't give me the money, then I cannot be responsible because I think we have too many critical errors even at that point. And I walked out of that executive board meeting with my money. I was, actually, I was stunned. because I didn't think I'd get the money, but it happened. Um, then I need to know about the IT assets. Now, bless them, IT have a tough job. And... I need to know about the hardware and the software assets. I need to know that. If you don't know what assets you have, how can you manage them? If you can't manage them that way, how can you monitor them? And poor old IT don't often have that many tools to do the monitoring. They're too busy running things. Now, we talked about the risk appetite. If you say to a board, what is your risk appetite? They just look at you blank. Oh, I don't even know what that is. I said, well, what it means is that when something happens to your organization, when are you going to start crying? When is it going to really hurt? When is it going to spend, you have to spend a lot of money or are you going to lose a lot of money? So you have to coax them along. And then we want to know about past failures. That I've known companies that have had malware attacks in the past and they haven't told anybody. And then when we've done a, a massive scan of the infrastructure, we're picking up all these items and these servers uh, that have been affected and some have been infected, so there's a difference. Affected and infected are, are slightly different. So we found places where there's all this stuff hides away, and these guys who write, who, who are programmers in here, by the way? Who are coders? So I call you guys software terrorists, because you write stuff that none of us ever understand. So when you talk Czech to me, it's like you're writing code. I have no idea what you're saying. And we know that coders put Easter eggs in their code just to say, hey, look at it. Ooh. So I think when, before your, most of your time, we had Word Perfect and Word. We know that when you clicked a certain button on a keyboard, that there used to be a, a, a taxi would go across the screen with some smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe. And it used to crash into the Word, in Microsoft Word Perfect, rather than going for, it was just to say there was a fight between Word Perfect uh, and, and Word. Um, so we need to know about that sort of stuff. And then it's crucial to build relationships that's where you put on a lot of weight. I used to be a fit young guy, but now I've put on too much weight. And you have to have lots of meetings with people and lots of coffee. <laughs> Which is not a bad job, after all. OK, um, so what you have to do as well is work out, there are so many security frameworks in the world, you have to work out which one would be best for you. So um, Vladimir, who is uh, the senior guy at Foresight, he and I used to agree that we would probably take some of the CIS controls, which is more to do with technical stuff, and then we would take some of the ISO IEC 27001 series stuff, and we would take some stuff out of there because that's more about security management. 
So together, we felt they, were, they offered a better function, a better security function in an organization. But you can go and look at all these. Um, I've got a feeling Lukash might be saying something about those. So anyway, there's all these requirements that you can build a security framework on. Okay, I'm sorry this is a bit hard to read. Um, there was a company I worked at, and, and uh, they looked after high-wealth individuals. What I mean by that is that these guys are probably worth upwards of 10 millions to billions. And the company I worked for had absolutely all their personal information, names, dates, birthdays, passport copies, anything to steal someone's identity. And it, it isn't difficult to steal someone's identity. And so one of the things I was worried about was data privacy. You might say data privacy, they both work for me. And when I did a quick check with some of the limited tools I had, these green blobs here just show you where personal information, that's you, that's your bank details, your building society, passport information, where you live, what houses you have, all that information is really personal to you. And if someone else had that information, they would use it against you. And the ones in red are all the areas that I found that had personal information that wasn't known to IT. And so you can see, certainly outside the European Union, the European economic area, sorry, um, people were stashing stuff in all sorts of web-based storage without permission. And so if we spent 500,000 pounds, a million pounds, or a million kroners, in some ways we're wasting our money because people themselves are not following the rules and they got it stuffed outside. So I went to the boss and I just said, look, this, is, this can't be done. You have to bring that information in. That was a big struggle to get that sorted because people often work in a specific way and they handle data in a specific way. And when Bob comes along and says, that's not good, They'll just say, well, we've always done it this way. Yeah, and that's why your data leaks. So I asked this question when I was here three years ago. How many databases do you think an average person has that's not his but where his data is stored? Have a guess how many databases there are that your information is stored somewhere. Somebody give me an answer or just throw something out there. Thousand? Anybody more or less than a thousand? Come on, it's a two-way thing. A lot, a lot. it's a fine. It's, it's around about 400 to 500 databases, at least, where your information, as you get older, you have new banks, or you have a new building society, uh, you have uh, different addresses, you have different doctors, different veterinaries, different insurance, car, house, life. Each one of those has a database that has your name on it. And if those guys aren't looking after your information, you'll get your identity stolen. Which leads on to my next question. How many people in the room has had, have had their identity stolen? One, two, three. There's three of us in here. It's a pain to get your life back. Because in a joke in the UK, we say, computer says no. So when you ring a help desk, whether it's a bank or a building society, you say, yeah, this is Bob. And they said, yeah, we've no record of you. No you, no, you got the wrong password. And I had this with our tax department. It's called uh, HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. They're the guys who take all your tax of your pay and stuff. And they wrote me a letter to say, you owe us money. And I said, I don't. They said, yeah, you're claiming for family credit. Well, family credit is for people who have children. And people at that time was, were earning £21,000 a year. I was earning more than 21,000 pounds a year, and I don't have any children. So how can I owe you money? And what had happened was that someone had stolen my identity. And they'd stolen it from a database that we didn't know about. But when you're on the phone and you say, yeah, I'm Bob, and, and this is my social security number, and this is my information, they say, no, it's not you. And you're sat there saying, well, I know, it's me, it's me, it's me. I wrote, I wrote to them and, and said, look, I'm not paying it. I will see you in court. And what's happened is that it's the responsibility of, the, of government departments in the UK. You must have accurate data on people. I think it's in part of the uh, GDPR anyway. Um, and so I said to you, I will see you in court. And by the way, this is clearly a case of stolen identity. 
It took the government six months to write back to me. And in that six months, I tried to get different things back. And they wouldn't change the record because, no, you're not Bob. I'm Bob, I'm me, I've got my passport. Look, it's there, and I've got my credentials. No. So it does cause you an issue. And you will get your data stolen from somewhere if you stick it all over the internet. Okay, let's look at the assessment then. And uh, we're going to do some lots of analysis. Is there a way of turning these front lights off? It seems a bit, it, it interferes with the... Can we do that? That's better, yeah. Is that better for you guys? Okay, yeah. So I, I want to um, understand the current security maturity, if there is one. Okay, so I want to see what the IT, and this is why I sit down and have lots of coffee with IT. So I need to understand their network before I can sit down with them and organize what devices and appliances will put in the network. And as soon as you say, I want to put an appliance on the network, head of IT says, oh, no, no, please don't. <laughs> they hate security guys putting stuff on. Um, and then next thing is that, okay, uh, Mr. IT, I need to scan your infrastructure with all sorts of tools. And you have a bit of a fight on your hands because they want to run a stable environment. They don't want you scanning their infrastructure and picking up stuff. They don't like it. But we have to go through that pain. Um, I need to know what external agencies there are. So are, are there external agencies that are looking after your equipment? Are there security companies remoting in? Are there IT companies remoting in? Or are there links to people you provide services to from your organization? All of those have got to be checked. And I think there was a call at the presentation earlier on about VPNs and connectivity from A to B and stuff. Um, I need to know if we've got any security assets. Often not. Um, Budgets, and there's often not a budget. They haven't thought about a budget, or we'll, there will be a big fight over, I need money. Actually, this is what helps with IT, that when I sit them down with IT, I say, look, you need some new servers, because those things are just old, and they'll get hacked, because they're on the threat list. And that helps IT get more money to get the kit, and they're happier, because that means that they're running new kit, and not old stuff they have to look after. And then is executive support. Um, in one location I, I was at, we have an exec board, and then we have a chief, inf a chief uh, executive officer who's a key guy, but above him sits someone we call the chairman, and it's his job to keep the board in, in true and they don't misbehave. And on one um, briefing I gave on, on uh, ransomware, I changed and had a dotted line. I normally report you have a, si a solid line to report to someone above you, but actually I jumped two levels above the CEO to the chairman. He said, I want Bob to have a dotted line to me. And if he's unhappy with what the CEO is doing, if he's unhappy with the exec board, come straight to me. Now, clearly I wouldn't because that's a, that would just stop my career dead because the CEO would probably end up trying to fire me. He doesn't want people going outside the chain of command. But the, the chairman was, was really up for securing his organization. He, re he recognized that we, we could get hacked and, and therefore we need to have more robust security. So again, you can see when I first started about who the C C CISO is and the sort of things he, she, and they have to do. And also, were there past problems? And often you find there have been problems in the, in the uh, company and they've just buried things. So it doesn't come out in the press. You often find companies, I know GDPR says, you're supposed to tell the authorities and your country, uh, whatever the organization is called, but the information commission of your countries, when you have a breach of a certain type. I know, I know fairly well that a lot of companies just bury it and don't tell anybody because they'll get a bad press. And they're, they're more likely to get away with it than get caught. So they do it. Everybody with me so far? Not boring, is it? Not too boring? Um, okay, this is a good example. Um, I will tell you that this was a government organization. Um, I'd been there maybe a year. Things were not working out between myself and my team and the IT. Uh, I don't mean to pick on IT all the time, but you know, see there's a member of the audience. Um, so the IT will give me information about the infrastructure and the state of the servers and, and they were um, all getting their antivirus malware stuff up to date on a regular basis. Excuse my French, but I know this is bullshit. So, unbeknownst to the head of IT, even the head of the physical security of the building, and this is a five, six story building, housed about two and a half thousand people. 
I called in a penetration test team. They call them tiger teams or red teams. And I said, break into my building. There are no rules. You can break in whatever you want. I want you to break into the IT network. I want you to gain admin permission. I want you to steal 10 gigabytes of data. I want you to, I want you to steal some financial data from the financial team. As it says there, there's only four people knew. That was one security guard who had a serious conversation with his boss because he should have told his boss and I told him not to, otherwise I would fire this guy. And then the team came in and nobody knew where they were. They just came in the building. They got through the physical security. They plugged into an outside telephone point behind the security barriers, got into the network, got themselves to the barrier to release itself, got inside the building, they split into teams of two. Two went on the third floor, I think, and two went on the fifth floor. They found a PC, took it to bits, rebuilt it, plugged it in. It had admin access. They then gained themselves super user access on the network. They then stole the data that we wanted them to steal. Well, sorry, borrow the data that we wanted them to borrow. <laughs> Redistribute it, if you like, to a USB key. And then they left the building and we met them in a coffee shop across the street. Now, they had remote access as well, so they could actually operate the network from the cafe across the road. This is no word of a lie. This is what actually happened. And I went to talk to the exec board, and I said, hey, we've got a serious problem here. This team, who knew nothing about our network, I invited them in to break into our building, break into our network, and they succeeded. Have a guess how long it took them to do all that. Two and a half hours. They owned everything, everything. It was incredible. And so what I'm trying to say to you guys is that there are people out there who will do you harm. And so I'm always like, I'm loath to trust people straight off because I know I've been there. So this was shocking. It was really shocking. And then there was a, there was a lot of people's noses out of joint because they got called in to the exec board to say, you know, what the hell's going on? And actually IT got a huge boost in their monies because they need stuff. And then people had their local admins taken away. How many people here have got the local admins on their normal standard PC? You're not going to tell me, are you? Because you'll get it taken away tomorrow. But that's what happens. Get admin access, and then it's easy. It's, it's easy then. OK. Uh, right, plan. So we're going to do this plan. If I don't get business support, then I think I'm sunk. I need people to support what I'm trying to do. And, and the output from them must be shared with them as well. There's no secrets here. We share everything we can with our teams. So we need, definitely need the IC support. We definitely do. Can't do it without them. Okay, we can, but we're not going to, because we can hack it and do it that way, but that's not the way we operate. So we have to know what regulation, legislation, and what other policies are required, because um, you have to operate under GDPR. The UK doesn't, because they're out of the union now, Brexit, boo. No one's mentioned it yet, have they? So, I was a Remainer, by the way. I wanted to stay in the EU. So, I'm your friend. Um, and then you want to decide on the security criteria and the model we use. So, ISO 27001 or CIS controls or NIST or whomever it might be. Um, and I might not have the skills necessary. So, I might have to tap into, for example, Foresight Cyber. Hey, you guys, can you come and do this? Um, I know they don't do um, penetration testing. So, what we do is we go to a specialist company that does penetration testing that has passed some government criteria. And the difference between a passive test and an active test is that we can use the Qualys tool to knock on doors and say, yeah, open, close, open, close, ah, and, we, and it logs it all. Whereas an, a, an active test, a penetration test, will open that door and then he will go through and he'll wander through and he'll wander through the network structure. And that's what we do with pen testing from a, from a technical perspective. We either just knock on the door and say, oh, that's open. Tell IT, hey, you've got a door open here. You better fix it in case someone runs through that door, you know, specifically firewalls. But if we have an active test that actually goes inside and tries to do something, and that's, that, that definitely helps the IT guys. So we often get someone in because these people who do penetration testing are a bit weird, a bit like programmers. They're a bit weird. They just live, eat, sleep, breathe, hacking. That's what they do. It's just a, it's just a white hacking. Okay, I don't know if I'm running over a little bit. Okay, um, deployment. So I think this, this point in time in my 100 days, I'm 
hanging on. <laughs> I've got all this stuff coming in. I've got to analyze it. Or I've got to get it sorted. And therefore, what do I deploy? Now, the first 100 days are nowhere near enough for me to get a full grasp of what I have to deal with, which business departments I have to deal with, what sort of money I've got. Anybody here try to get money? Certainly university guys, for stuff, to buy stuff. It goes through committee after committee after committee. Hackers don't wait. They, they'll be in. So uh, these sort of things will hold me up. So um, I may use Skybox, and I may use Qualys, and I may use Tenable, all different types of tools. And that means what I can do working with the IT guys would be we scan the infrastructure. And then we, we sit down in a big meeting and say, hey, do you realize you've got 7,000 endpoints and you've got 10 firewalls and you've got hundreds of routers and stuff? And that's what we do. And then what those tools will do will interrogate for me what their current status is from a security perspective. Is it up to date with the latest? Actually, is it something that IT owns? As we going back a few minutes, I said that some people put stuff on the network. It's difficult to find. So these, these tools will then scan the infrastructure and just grab all this information. And then luckily enough, some of the artificial intelligence will then work out what that is, where it is, what its status is. And often you can give you links to do A, B, and C and resolve whatever problem that is. And what I'll do is I'll feed that up as a big report this big, and I'll narrow it down to just, say, two summary pages. If you want to give the executive board time, don't give them a long document. It's two pages. There it is. And I normally have that on the first page. If you don't do this, these three things, and I keep it to three things. If you don't do this, these three things will happen, and this is what's going to cost you in loss. And when you put money in front of a board, that's when they wake up and say, ah, oh, can't afford to do that. We better give them some money and, and get it fixed. So, that's, so I'm, I'm unlikely at that, net, that stage to deploy anything other than this information gathering tool that I have. And at least I can then go to the board and say, here is evidence that this is what the network looks like. Okay, and I, so a quick recap then. I start off at the bottom, keep the faith, because it's a long job, even 100 days. You do work long hours. I'm not looking for sympathy. But it's a, it's, a, it's a great job. It's a challenging job, being a CISO. But you have to have so many characteristics and so many traits and so much experience in a whole range of thing, things. And therefore, I think it's going to be like a flexible project because you'll find things that they're so critical, you have to stop and fix it now. And you'll find some other stuff. So you use your experience to say, this is going to be... Category one or category five, if category five is the highest, then you say, I've got to fix these things. So you may have to fix those few things in the first 100 days. And don't forget, I said at the beginning, it's, it's 100 days notionally, but it just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Take all the weekends off and then take all the holidays off. Take the time off when people aren't available to talk to. So um, look at the, the frameworks. Fully understand the business needs because you can talk to one person in the business and they'll give you answer A. Talk to another person in the same business, they'll give you answer B. So that's the verify what information you get. Um, one thing you have to do is don't get bogged down in the detail because you, do, you can make this life so, so difficult. You have to keep it at a high level and then later on in your, after your 100 days, you'll create a bigger plan of what I'm going to do. What is the security strategy over the next three years to five years? Because you have to invest money time and effort, you might need people coming in full time to work for you in, in a security team, or you might outsource it and say we get somebody in internally. Um, clear briefings, keep your documentation clear, and then I say keep the faith. You, you have to keep going because you expect obstacles. You wouldn't do the job if you didn't, probably like IT, you know, you know damn well there's going to be some obstacles, but you have to overcome them. Okay, um, right, so my recommendations are Build it right first time. Take the time. And I think I hark back to the presentation three, three or four years ago, some of the coders we were talking to. And I know that coders are really important to an organization. You're writing programs to run stuff, certainly in open source. We all know that often programmers get really tight time schedules to finish a project and build something. It's like an almost impossible time and task. 
So they cut corners and then hackers will know that. Hackers know you guys don't get enough time, you don't get enough money, you don't have enough staff. And they would exploit that. So build it right first time, make it secure by design. This is where the team has to work with security, with finance, uh, with IT. And you have to make sure that whatever you design has security built in from the start. And it's an old, it's an old saying that it costs over three times as much to bolt it on afterwards. Because by and large, you'd have to undo things, put them back together again. So get it right first time. And then manage responsibly. Because you then have to manage security. IT will manage all the networks to do it as, as securely and safely as you can. And finally, hackers only have to find one hole in your network. And you've got to find them all. I know people who've been fired from a company who have had remote access and admin access at that, and they had it three months later. They still had access to the whole network three months later, and all the data. That's, that's just bloody lunacy. It's crazy. But that happens in real life. So um, you've got to find them all, and that's, that's a toughie. I think that's about it. So thank you very much. And any questions? The copy one. No questions? Oh, come on. Ah, uh, oh, good, because I flew all this way. Oh, you have to have the microphone. Wait one moment, please. So this is not exactly a question, just a note. Uh, you talked about uh, risk appetite and how perhaps organiza organizations are not willing to uh, spend more money on information security. Yes. Uh, from my experience, organizations are willing to spend money if it makes them money. And, uh, yes. Improving your information security Ideally, you spend a lot of money to so all, all the things stay the same and you don't lose your customers yep. and so on. That doesn't make you money. So you sure. That's per perhaps the, the problem. Yes. Um, the, the route I often take is that the risk decision is the board meeting. Okay, the, the executive board are the people who make those high-level decisions. I try not to make the decision for them. What I'm saying is, look, here is the problem. Here is the impact if something happens. Here are the consequences. If you don't do that, you're going to lose this, this, and this. You're going to lose a million pounds over here. You're going to lose your best customers over there because they can't get access to the stuff they need. And then I say, look, this is what I can do. Here's the solution. And I can often give them three solutions, okay? And when I write a report, I have three key recommendations, okay? And I know damn well they won't give me all the money I want. Never put the one you want as option A. I always put mine at option B. It seems to work most of the time. So I, I say to the board, over to you, it's your company, you employ me as your, your sitting expert on security and cyber security. Cyber security, computer security, information security, in my head, it's just the same stuff. Some is more technical than the others. But let's say, look, you, you, you've invested in me to come and work for you and secure information, you secure your IT systems. That's my job. It's your decision whether you want to take my advice or ignore it. And also coming from a consultancy background, I spent many years as a consultant, I would write these reports and hand them over to the company. And if they didn't do anything about my recommendations, hey, don't come back to me because I've explained to you what the key things are. But if you keep it clear and precise, so that two-pager, I mean, the whole report I write is usually quite large, but just given those two pages, you can take it from the front of the report, two pages, that focuses. The, they, they don't want to know any more than three things. Give me the top three things. I know there's loads of other stuff. Give me top three things, and I'll have to go, and look, go away and look at it. And the board will then come back and tell you what they want to do. Fine. And then you redo some of the report to say, okay, so these are the risks that are outstanding, so beware. And I might talk to the IT guys and say, okay, we need to build a resilient plan because if, excuse my offense, shit happens, as it does, at least we have a plan to work together and fix it. That's why I see my responsibility stopping at a certain level. I'd love to go further, but I don't have the authority. Good question, though. Okay, one more question. Oh, 
Oh no, <laughs> foresight cyber. Yeah, sorry. Um, I would just to like to add that when you mentioned that companies often hide the fact that they've been hacked, I would like to add that a few weeks ago, we probably all remember that Uber was hacked. Uh, the story goes, or it's a fact, it was confirmed that uh, the CISO of the company actually paid the hackers with their bug, uh, bug bounty program, yeah. uh, the ransom, to keep it a uh, secret. And he, I believe, was sen sentenced uh, to jail. So I, I just wanted to add that it is an e example of this. Well, uh, my view is crime pays. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a report out, and it said something like, less than one-tenth of one percent of hackers get to court. I don't know what it is in the check, but I think it was even less than, much, much less than that, 0 0.1 of 0 0.1 of 0 0.1, actually go to jail. And don't forget, we're still looking for, whoever wants, to, anybody here want to earn a few billion, billion, billion crowns? We're still trying to find the crypto queen. Where's she gone? She's, she's escaped with four billion dollars in crypto fraud. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of Palinka Slivovitsa. <laughs> That's a lot of Urquell Pilsner. And then, uh, if you read it in the papers last week, the FBI, so I'm over in too much, so I'm sorry, I'm keeping you. One more thing. Um, the FBI um, announced last week an investigation which was, you're not putting this in yours, are you? Is it in yours? Is that in my, about the FBI and uh, hacking? Is it in your, is it in your? Okay. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, is it, are you mentioning it in your presentation? FBI. Or not? Okay. FBI. I don't want to steal. I don't want to steal your thunder. No, no, this was the, this, this, the, the, <laughs> this is the FBI. Um, I'd, I'd uh, released the information. They targeted this guy, uh, had an oriental name, uh, uh, like a Christian former name and an, an oriental Wang or Wang, I think his, his name was. Um, they recovered $3.5 billion in crypto and other things. It, it, one was hidden in a chocolate box in his house. Um, under the floorboards was a hidden safe and there were uh, old hard drives all containing cryptocurrency. This cryptocurrency had got lost over the years and it was mounting up. And this guy hacked into the system. It would really quick, he could hack in, get crypto coins, steal them, close the door and they wouldn't even know he'd been in. He'd been doing this. And the FBI tracked him down over the years and in 20, yeah, it was re recently, so I think two years ago or something, a year ago, they actually got him, it's only now they're releasing the information. So all on the dark web. So guys, these criminals are out there. Trust no one, suspect everyone, right? Keep your, keep your data safe. Right, I've got, I've got to go, because I'm holding the lady up. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, you still have that. Yeah, I've going to, well, they, they told me that Czech beer is called Czech bread. So when my wife asked me, did I drink any beer when I'm in Czech, I said, no, I ate lots of bread. Another bread, thank you. You can blame the foresight guys for doing that. So. Okay, we have some more time. Uh, any questions? Oh, you, can, you can talk to me later if you want to. You can talk to me later and I'll answer questions. I think there's a, something afterwards, is there? So, yeah, I, I can. But I can only talk to you in Chinglish or English. <laughs> Sorry. Any answers? If not questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.